Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. What would be three things we could watch out for as parents that might cause our kids in some measure to begin to become disquieted, dispirited, discouraged? And I'd like to suggest these three to you. First of all, is that we need to watch out that we don't insult them. As I went through the study of the word of the tongue, you're going to find that it seems like our tongue has the ability to tear down or to build up. Now our tongue, when I talk about tearing down, that's not necessarily bad. We parents need to take wrong reasoning of our kids and adequately and lovingly tear that wrong reasoning down. If they've got a secular worldview, they're embracing a philosophy that is anti-biblical. We don't tear them down. We have to engage them in a safe conversation, but our words and our truths needs to tear down that false teaching. But when we do, we need to build up the right kind of truth. We need to build them back up again. And so our words are very valuable. They can either set it on fire, they can destroy it, or they can build it up. And I know that sometimes, because we live now today in light that is so fast that we don't have the time to rationally teach them to rethink, to get the right behavior out of them, that it's easier to say, shut up, I'm talking. It's easier to say, I'm the parent, you obey me. It's easier to say, do it my way. It's easier to do that because we muscle them down. And what we did is we might have controlled them for the moment because we're bigger than them right then, but we haven't changed their thinking. And those are the kids that eventually will do all the wrong stuff away from you as long as they, don't, you, they know you don't see them. Or they're the ones that once they bolt from your house, you wonder why we had all this stuff going on and now look at them. They kind of went to hell in a handbasket out there. Why is that? It could be because the words that we use might have been right, but we didn't use the right knowledge and reasoning. Now stay with me on this. And that could be because we got so busy with life that we didn't train ourselves to understand what are they thinking? Why is that really wrong? And so all we're trying to do is we know what's right and wrong, but we don't know how we got there. And we need to learn how we got there. And often that's going to come through Scripture. So let me give you a number of Bible verses here. Just look at them. Proverbs 15, 1 and 2, it says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So think about the terms of harsh words. Is that causing anger? The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, not as a weapon. Some of you know a lot. Some of you know a lot of Bible, and you can fling verses at them. You can fling principles at them, fling truth at them. You might know it rightly, but will you communicate it lovingly? But the mouth of fools just pour out foolishness. It says a wholesome tongue is like a tree of life. And usually I, I think a tree of life is a tree of growth. I need a tree of life. And words can be the same way. Our tongue, wholesome words, will bring life, not death. But perverseness in it breaks the spirit. We don't want to break the spirit. We want to break the will. Then it says, A man who has joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. I wonder if we're destroying and killing the emotions in our kids or are we building them up and giving them life and vitality and vibrancy. And for you ladies, you mothers, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. In Isaiah 50, verse 4 says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word. Would you circle the word how? It's not just speak the word. I need to know how to speak the word. And then in season, circle that and put when to speak it. And then it says, To him who is weary, then put to who to speak it. So how should I do it? When should I do it? And to who should I do it? And where does it come from? The Lord who gave me the tongue of the learned. Now, listen. How I, become the to how I get the tongue of the learned is that I choose to shut the TV off. I choose not to go out every week with my friends so I have time to stay in God's Word. I lean into the messages. I get the tapes. I listen to them again. I become a student of this book because I know that the hope and the future of my kid is often dependent upon who I am as a person, and who I am as a person is dependent upon the richnesses I have of God's Word dwelling in me richly that we've already studied. Notice how one truth builds upon another truth, how rich this stuff is. So let's be careful that we don't insult them. How many of you remember about a year ago there was an actor by the name of Alec Baldwin, and he was trying to call his daughter on the cell phone. She was 12 years old, and she didn't respond as quickly or when he thought she should. 
and he blasted her so badly and it was recorded and it then hit the airwaves. How many of you remember that story? Some of you have not. I, don't, I will not read you the entire, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, transcript, but listen to this. And I'm going to tell you, if you were a 12-year-old, if your child was hearing a phone call from you, what do you think they would do if Alec Baldwin was working and speaking through you? Alec says this. Hey, I want you to tell, I want to tell you something, okay? I want you to leave, I want to leave a message for you right now. Because again, it's 1030 here in New York on a Wednesday, and once again, I've made a blank of myself trying to get to a phone to call you at a specific time. When the time comes for me to make the call, I stop whatever I'm doing and I go and I make that phone call at 11 o'clock in the morning in New York. And if you don't pick up that phone at 10 at night and you don't have even the expletive phone turned on, I want you to know something. I'm tired of playing this game with you. I'm leaving this message with you to tell you you've insulted me for the last time to a 12-year-old. You have insulted me. You don't have the brains or the decency of a human being. I don't give a blank that you're a 12 year old or 11 years old or that you're a child or that your mother is a thoughtless pain in the blank who doesn't care about what you do as far as I'm concerned. You have humiliated me for the last time with this phone. Notice it's all about him. And when I come out there next week, I'm going to fly out there for the day just to straighten you out on this issue. Now think about that girl hearing this. I'm going to let you know just how you disappointed, uh, just how disappointed I am in you and how angry I am with you that you've done this to me again. You've made me feel like blank again, all about him. And you've made me feel like a fool over and over again, again about him. And this blank you pull on me with this blank phone situation that you would never dream of doing to your mother. I'm going to get on a plane. I'm going to come out there. I'm going to straighten you out. I'm going to kick your blank. Do you understand me? I'm going to... I'm going to really make sure you get it. Then I'm going to get on the plane again, and I'm going to turn around and come home. So you better be ready for me on Friday the 20th to meet with me. So I'm going to let you know just how I feel about what a rude little pig you really are. You are a rude, thoughtless little pig. And then it goes on, and I'm going to quit with that. I think you got the message. I imagine if you're 12 years old, you just can't wait for Daddy to come off that plane, can you? But I know that some of you are cringing inside of you, and you're thinking, how could he read that? But some of you, you're saying, you know, I can hear my own voice. Now, it wasn't over a phone issue. It might have been over something else. But I remember that I lost it with my kid, and I told him the same things. And frankly, with all the love that I have for you and for me, because we've all done it, I hope you're, you're broken. I hope you're uncomfortable right now. I hope you feel shamed. And shame on every parent, on all of us parents that have ever done this. But I also want you to know that God is a God of grace, forgiveness, and hope. But you've got to come to Him with that, that ball of shame and brokenness and failing. That you've provoked your child. You're disquieting that child. And you say to Him, Lord, by the grace of God, you made me new. And I want you to live that new life out through me. And I want to have a new relationship with my kids. And maybe for some of you, you need to go back to them. And one more time, take responsibility for where you blew it with your words. And you kids, don't be so smug. You probably have not said words where your mom and dad ever heard you, but it would not surprise me that you have said a lot of stuff screaming into your pillow or on your phone or texting your friends about your mom and dad. And I hope you feel very guilty. A mom and dad who gave you all that you have, that you can come here, that you can have the friends that you have and all the blessings that God has given to you. That of all the parents in the world, God specifically designed for you to have the parents you have because God wants to do a work in you that He could only do with the parents that He gave you. And so when you shun them, you shun Him. Well, we can insult our, our, our kids, but there's also a, a second thing we can do that we need to be careful of, and that is to ignore them, to ignore our kids. Now, there are a lot of different reasons we could ignore them, but I'm not going to go into them. I'm going to talk about that on the third bullet point. But I want to mention to you, for some of you that are knowledgeable in the Bible for a moment, do you remember that there was a time that David himself, King David, the greatest king that Israel had ever known, made a major failure as a man, as a husband, and as a father. And because of all of that, his moral fragility then was so messed up in the way he reared his kids that he had a son named Absalom and a couple other kids and some of them was incest going on between them and then Absalom took over and then he gets involved and bloodshed within the family and then David then gets on his high horse and then Absalom then gets kicked out and Lee leaves and then he kind of comes back but here's the point Absalom wanted to see his dad and for two years his own dad wouldn't even see him and had a great opportunity for some form of reconciliation, but his dad just basically blew him off and ignored him. 
And then we know what happened then. We knew then that Absalom stole the hearts of the people away from King David and then David had to flee and there was a whole lot of chaos. You talk about leadership that's gone on a slippery slope into destruction and one of the areas that David could have stepped up was not to ignore a son. Wrong or right, he needed to talk it out, talk story, ho'oponopono with him and work it out, but he didn't do it. And so I would like to encourage you, please don't ignore your kids. Now, I know there are times that you have to put them in a timeout. I know there are times when you're adult talking and the kid comes up. You have to teach them that they don't interrupt anybody. It's inappropriate to interrupt people when they're speaking, that that child needs to learn these type of truths. But it doesn't mean you ignore them. It means that when that child and you put them in a moment, that you ask them to just step aside for a moment while you finish your conversation, that you make sure that nothing else happens that as soon as that conversation is over with, you go back to that child and you give them all the honor and the attention that's appropriate or you put them in a position where you will get back to them. So ignoring them can come many different ways. And the third way we do it is that we indulge our kids. Sometimes because we insult them and we ignore them, then there's this, uh, this guilt that comes on. Yeah, we're really, we need to do a better job with our kids. But the problem is we don't go back to the biblical way to make it right. Then we end up saying, you know what, we'll just indulge the kids and give them stuff. And so how do we do that? What are the reasons we do that? Let me go through these quickly. First of all, we do it to escape responsibility. Sometimes we get so busy that we don't want to have time with our kids, so we pawn our kids off in a lot of different clubs and uh, um, activities because those activities, those clubs, those events will babysit our kids for us so we have the time that we have. And the only thing we're obligated to do is to get them back and forth. We're obligated a little bit maybe to show up at a planning meeting, occasionally show up at their event, but we don't really get engaged into their inner life. And so we can escape our responsibility. Now, I don't want you to feel wrong that it's, you can't get them involved in soccer or ballet or hula and all this stuff. I'm just saying just ask yourself, what is your proper motivation for them to do it? Is it emotionally, socially, spiritually healthy for them? And then ask yourself, it is about them to help them out. Or is it more about me because I want to have time to do what I want to do, so I'm going to dump them on the society. Number two, in order to gain social standing, Maybe what you did not have or could not do as a child, you're going to relive in your own, chi your own childhood through them. So you couldn't be a beauty queen, so your child becomes a beauty queen. You couldn't do sports, so now your kid is involved in every sport that comes down the pike. And so again, you could be indulging them instead of asking them, is this really the very best for the child? Watch this, watch this. And is what I'm doing for the child best for the harmony of the entire family? Sometimes we sacrifice the harmony of the family on the altar of one child. Number three, because the parent has a false understanding of child rearing. They really don't understand how to really work with a child. They don't know how to respond to a child when a child is whining or pouting, pouting or sulky. Sometimes we, we give in to these things just because we want peace and quiet. Number four, because of misguided devotion and love. Sometimes we ourselves are so much wanting to get love back from these kids, we, we think that if we would give them this kind of stuff, that we will get them to love us. So we buy them, we manipulate, we do things because we think they're going to love us. Watch this, for all that we buy and give to them. When really kids are just saying, I just want you, Dad. I just want you, Mom. Would you just sit on the edge of my bed and tell me everything's going to be okay? Would you run your hand through my hair? Would you do it when I know that you have to give up something that's neat for you because you do it for me? So are you doing and buying and indulging because of a lack of understanding that your love comes from the Lord? Then the fifth one is because of insecurity and your lack of purpose. Some parents, uh, they have no purpose in their own life, so they play house with their own kids. They pamper and they cling to the kids. They don't have any life, so their whole life is only their kids. And I would only tell you that if you do that then you become really nothing more than a chauffeur. You really become nothing more than a, than a, a nanny instead of being a parent. So watch this, watch this. That's why you kids need to allow mom and dad to have time with each other, time to develop their own personhood so that they can grab knowledge and information and things of life that they can bring back to you. And so you have to have your own identity, but don't suck from your kids your identity. It's between you and the Lord. Your kids are a part of it, there's no doubt. But they're not the center of it. Look at the next thought there. Don't fail to accept that things change. I'm speaking on behalf of the kids for a moment. Things change. I know it's hard for you to believe, but I'm at a grandparent... Carol and I are at grandparent age right now. 
We have kids. I, I have, we have our, the boy, one of the boys that we adopted is older than we've been married together. Okay, We've been married 39 years. He's 40. Do you know that we could have a grandkid at 20? Does that mean we could be great-grandparents too? I don't know. But here's where I'm going with that. The generation that we did youth group in is a lot different than the generation that our kids are doing youth group in and our grandkids are doing youth group. They wear different clothes today. They wear their hair differently. They go to places differently. They look at life a little differently. And so what I'd like to tell the moms and dads and the grandpas and grandmas and aunties and uncles is that life does change. Kids have a whole different way. They communicate differently. They text message. They email. They play games differently. We get so excited if we could have all the friends over to our house and we could play Monopoly or Risk. Today, if you don't have a big screen TV with all the st special stuff with the special games, I don't, I don't play games, so I don't know this stuff. And we'd look at them and think, well, they're really wasting their time. Well, I don't know much about that a little bit. But I just want to encourage you moms and dads that don't try to, to put them in the way we were back when we were a kid. We have to let them be them in their own world. Now, I said that against this backdrop. Kids, listen to this, because I'm telling your parents what they may allow you to change on certain things, but there's three non-negotiable things that they should not let you change on. Here they are. Number one is rebellion. Check that off real quickly. Rebellion. Rebellion. If they sense from you that you're rebelling against any authority, they have to nip that in the bud because if they don't break that within you, this passion to be rebellious. Now, it does, you can agree to disagree, but you can do it cheerfully with respect and obedience. But we're talking about rebellion. Another word for that same camp of rebellion would be defiance. That's not number two. So when you have a child that's defying you, and you can see that as they're growing up. No, I'm not going to do it. No, no. Okay, that's rebellion, and it's starting young, and it's easier to correct it when they're young. Train your puppies when they're young, and you'll have a nice dog when they're old. No, just a joke, kids. All right, next, immorality. There is no room to change an immorality. God never changes on that. And would you look up here because I want you to see as much as I can portray you. I know it sounds like I'm barking at you, but I love you. What I'm about to say is something I have not said from this pulpit in three years. Immorality has as its sister word, immodesty. We, I have not spoken to the issue of modesty. I'm not talking about long, what's short necessarily. I'm not talking about a tank top to a cut off sleeves, but I am talking about that in your heart you know that when you wear something, do the eyes go to your parts of your body that should not go to the parts of your body. And so we talk with our kids about morality issues or immorality. Look at also the aspect of immodesty. Often what happens is immodesty is the step toward immorality. That's another time, but I just want you to know we don't change on that. And then the third one is injustice. Injustice. And if you want to know where kids will show injustice at the beginning of their life, it's going to be shown between brothers and sisters. God often allows brothers and sisters in the rivalry that you have to allow the, um, the character deficiency of the depravity of man, of injustice to show, to give moms and dads the opportunity to teach them what it means to be just and right with your kids, to teach them how to treat people justly and fairly. So look for injustice how they treat uh, your sons, how they treat uh, their mother. There was a time that our boys, because we got them when they were older and they had a lot of, their, their character and their personality, according to Minerth and Myers, was set in cement, that there were times, and you know my wife, she's very loving, she's very sweet, she's very kind, but my wife is also fearless. And so when she, and she's fearless about God and fearless about truth, and, and in her sweetness, she still will not, she, I don't want to say she's stubborn, because it's good to be stubborn at times, but she'd be rock. Sometimes I would hear our son go after Carol. And I'm sure maybe in your house that never happens, but sometimes the, the son is going to feel his oats against his mama. And so I, I'm not going to fight every one of Carol's battles, but I'm going to step back and I'm going to watch how these two will dialogue because it's important for this boy to learn how to respect to a woman who's in, an authority. That's a whole sermon right there, but let's leave that alone. And so I'm watching how my wife is going to navigate this son here to be able to show respect and submission cheerfully to a woman who's in authority over him. But when I saw that no matter what kind of loving reasoning that she was doing with our son, that he was escalating in this, then I had to step in. Now there's two, two comments. The first is, you don't speak that way to your mother. And that's easy to do. 
But the second one is what really caused him to kind of like slap him with a word, which is this. You don't speak that way to my wife. Do you hear where we're going with that? Because that, that child, that son needs to know how to communicate to a woman who's in authority and someday how to communicate to his own wife and you don't do that. So yes, you don't do that to your mother. Does that mean it's okay to do that to your wife? Nope. Can't do it either way. So you have to watch out for rebellion, injustice, and immorality. I want to end this little sermon here today. I know it's been a little bit long and all that. But I'm going to end you with a letter because I want to give you some hope. This last week unsolicitedly came to me from a dear brother in our church. He met with one of our guys early in the morning. He missed the family time that he had. He has it every morning with his family, family devotions, nearly every morning. And when he got back, there at his place where they normally have family devotions was a letter. I asked permission from the family, from the, mom, from the father and son, if I could read this to you. And I told him that I would not tell you who it was, and so I'm going to leave some stuff out because you might recognize him in the church our size, but I do have permission to read this. And what I want to read to you right now is the price that a mom and dad paid to live according to the book, and watch this, kids, and the price of a son who is willing to submit to the authority and to do it properly. So moms and dads treated the son properly, and the son treated mom and dad properly by writing a letter that was not requested, was not necessary, and Dad even missed that devotion that morning. Here's how it goes. Hey, Pop, I know that as a young man, it's difficult for me to share my deepest thoughts and appreciations with other people, especially you. Around the time of Father's Day this year, I was preparing to do a special topical teaching on Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul encourages children to honor and obey fathers and mothers. As I was studying and preparing, I realized how I absolutely failed to obey this command. Listen, he didn't say, I failed to obey you, Dad. I failed to obey the command. He got it right. As I begin to think of you and your relationship to me as a father, I started to realize that there are so many amazing characteristics and disciplines about you that I fail to recognize. The word honor in the Hebrew and Greek literally means to praise or recognize. When I thought of you, Pop, and all that you do, I felt very convicted and compelled to give you the honor that I believe you don't receive as much as you should from me. I'll begin with your amazing example you always leave for me with prayer. I can remember way before I even made a sincere commitment to follow Jesus with all that I am, I'd always see you praying, always offering up prayers and petitions to our Lord on all sorts of occasions. You, Pop, are definitely one who obeys these scriptures that I so deeply hold on to and try to obey. Next, I absolutely enjoy seeing oh, this is the sincere love that you have for Mom. The way you protect her and love her really encourages and stirs up a deep desire within me to one day if the Lord wills, to be a husband who loves his wife as Christ loved the church. I definitely will testify that you are a husband who deeply loves his wife as Christ loves the church. I totally love this about you. And then another characteristic of Christ that I've noticed in you is your order and discipline. This is an, exact, this is an example that you set for me that I absolutely love to follow. Two years ago, I would never imagine myself walking around with a planner. Now it is the one thing closest to me that keeps me on track. Pop, there are many more awesome characteristics that I recognize about you. These are just a few of the major ones that I wanted to let you know. Thank you for all your love, discipline, and devotion. You are the best father I could ever have. I love you, Pop, and I will continue to keep you and Mom in my prayers. I pray that God will bless you in this new season of life and that he will continue to move in and through you in a mighty way, your son, and he signs his name. Why am I doing this? I'm not puffing this family. What I'm trying to puff right now is the accuracy of Scripture. That if you live according to Scripture, you can have maybe not a letter like this. It's just a letter. But you can have a son like this. You can be a father or a mother like this. That it's all there for us right in God's word and the power is given there. But it takes a decision. You have to push the one-two button. 
And my prayer, whether you're listening on tape or radio or here today, that you would surrender to the Lordship of Christ and His Word so you can have a new relationship. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us Make It Clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.